welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. I'd like to invite um, one of our, our generous um, under supporters, um, Al McDonald of McDonald the McDonald Agape Foundation to come forward and to really help us sort of set this in perspective as um, Al has been here long before these four conferences. He was um, um, in the early conversations, of course, with Professor Elstein as to what the scope of this project is in its whole. Thank you, Michael. It's a great pleasure to be here and to hear these great discussions that have been going on for all four of these sessions, and particularly to have Gene's family here. I want to thank, uh, first of all, um, uh, Dean Margaret Mitchell and also Bill Spiker for their encouragement of uh, Gene and myself in proceeding with this series. But it's perhaps worth just a moment to think of why we are really here and how we got to be here. Uh, Jean and I, uh, I had the good fortune of meeting her about 15 years ago when I was a young man of only 70, and she was right in her prime in the mid-50s. Uh, we uh, spoke on difficult topics before a group in Philadelphia in which she was talking about some of the spiritual dimensions of politics and its importance to political thinking over a period of time. I had the challenging topic of the moral dimensions of capitalism and the value of one who devotes their careers to the creation of wealth, uh, a, a fairly difficult topic for the group that we were speaking to, uh, who were largely uh, scholars and theologians. But we began uh, a friendship at that time, and she kept showing up as uh, such a brilliant speaker at any number of conferences that we were sponsoring. And, and became interested in our work because we as a small family decided to contribute whatever we were fortunate to have, not to our four offspring or our 12 grandchildren, but to in fact contribute these funds for the encouragement of distinguished scholars for Christ in distinguished universities. And we are fortunate enough to be working now in seven, uh, five in the United States, including Chicago, uh, with programs at Harvard, Yale, Duke, uh, Emory, Chicago, and in Europe at, uh, with the McDonald Center at Oxford and also at Cambridge. Anyway, Jean and I started about seven years ago now, when she hit 75, uh, 65, to think about how, how she would be remembered. And, and I asked the question of what would be the central point of her legacy, because she had written about so much in so many areas that she almost qualified for the oxymoronic title of a generalist scholar because it, her movie reviews were sensational. But so were her comments on areas like this meeting and the others. And so we finally decided, and I said we would be willing to work with her to try to develop a series of conferences in which she could invite some of her favorite friends and those whose opinions she respected most to a conference under various topics. I suggested we have five. Fortunately, I was wrong. <laughs> we agreed on four. And she said, here are four major categories and we'll hold the most controversial to last. <laughs> And she would have dearly loved to be here to have been debating with the group and to counter some of the arguments that we've heard. But nevertheless, we agreed to begin this and we had the good fortune of this. And this is the last of our series, as is so timely. Although it is unfortunate, it had to be more of a memorial service in one sense than simply the conference that she had so looked forward to and that she had planned. Each one of you is to be highly complimented because you were invited by her personally, because of her fondness for you and her appreciation for your attitude. She constantly talked about her love for her family. So for all of you, 
you could always know that you were first in her mind and in her heart. And for those of us who are a friend, we could only not only welcome that, but be uh, amazed at her loyalties to each one of you, her strength as derived from her relationships with each one of you, and for her stimulation from her contact with scholars like this distinguished group we have before us here. But in the four of these conferences, which she selected, the major rubrics in which we said, let us try to synthesize some of your major writings and thinking. She said, good, then that would become a real legacy. And so our hope was that this would be the way to achieve something that appeared to be rather scattered and diverse prior to this time. And I hope that this has been accomplished. But we have had the opportunity to work with some 35 to 40 of her friends in the scholarly community. What a collection of individuals of great minds, of great hearts, and what a tribute both to her and to them uh, of their friendship over the ages. It showed her wide diversity of interest, of beginning with the subject of marriage and the family and feminism and ending up here talking about just war in very difficult political arenas. But I just wanted to play a final tribute to what was the purpose of this event, what she had in mind and what she hoped to accomplish with it. And in the minds of each of you, I would want you to know why are we really here? It was because of the thought of how Jean Bethke Elstein could in fact leave a few sentences of her many works in thinking, because she commented on almost any subject I can think about, including my area of economics, from your area of politics and just war to others in terms of feminism and almost any other subject you could talk about. She loved movies, and her movie reviews were some of the best. She could have easily made a career simply as, as a movie reviewer, among other things. But what a diversity of spirit, what a wonderful mind, what a great heart for the Lord. She and I shared one other thing, which was a very meandering um, uh, trip toward Rome. Uh, I made it about five years before she did at the early age of 79. Fortunately, she did what not wait until she was 79. <laughs> she decided about two years ago that uh, she also would cross the Tiber. But nevertheless, uh, uh, we are here as a tribute and, and truly as a legacy to one of the great minds, to one of the great members of the faculty of this wonderful school, the Divinity School of Chicago. And each of you are here because of her, her great love and respect for you and your views. I simply wanted to share these thoughts so that we had as background why we were here, why we are sponsoring it, and what we hope the accomplishments would be that come out of it. I hope each of you carries away a few thoughts from each of these sessions, from your rethinking of some of her thoughts and her writing that will be beneficial to you individually and collectively and to the school. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your presence and for your many contributions. God bless. You. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. McDonald, for those very kind remarks. Uh, this period, as you know, is, is uh, normally devoted to Jean's uh, response to our papers, and uh, I'm saddened, as I'm sure everyone else is, not to have her here to respond. Uh, I'm more saddened um, that she wasn't able to hear what we had to say about her work and about her, especially our deep gratitude respect our admiration for the intellectual and moral virtues that she embodied. I think she knew, I hope she knew, in what great esteem we all held her. Uh, so in lieu of the formal response period, the conference organizers decided to have uh, an open discussion period, and uh, Michael uh, buttonholed me and asked me if I'd like to open that up, and I said, I, I'm sure I don't have anything particularly interesting to say, and he said, very kindly, once again, would you like to have your travel expenses reimbursed? And I said, I'd be, ha I'd be glad to open that up. 
<laughs> so, um, but before I do that, I would just like to add uh, my thanks personally to Al McDonald and the McDonald Agape Foundation for the incredible support of these conferences. Uh, they meant so much to Gene. Uh, they were always the topics of conversations, uh, of my conversations at least, with her at dinner, over email, uh, over the phone, uh, in her final years here. Uh, they, these conferences, all of them, and the proceedings which I trust will follow from them will be absolutely crucial to securing fast her remarkable legacy and ensuring her ongoing influence on future generations, including all of us uh, here. So. All right. So let me just mention a few themes or questions I've noticed that have recurred at various points or various ways over the course of the last few uh, couple days. Uh, number one, uh, the question of what labels or names we assigned to, um, you know what, excuse me, I forgot to mention, mention something else, and I, it's, it's a terrible omission, so I have, I'm going to have to start again. A very, very important word of thanks needs to go to our conference organizer, Michael Le Chevalier, for his really heroic efforts putting this conference together. Now you um, be sure to get your, your Now, I, yeah, exactly. I knew that. Yeah. Um, and, and there were many other graduate students who helped, so I don't want to uh, overlook them, but I, there are really too many to name um, at this point. Uh, I organized many conferences while I was a graduate student here at the University of Chicago. As I know, I did Eric Owens and Deborah Erickson. Um, so we know really well all of the head work and all of the leg work that's involved uh, with being kind of the director behind the scenes. And uh, I know I'm very relieved to have a much more modest role to play this time. And I know that none of us ever faced the uh, challenges Michael did when um, the star of the show unexpectedly bade her early farewell. So there really, there's no understudy in this case who can step in to fill that role. So that's the preface to the remarks that I have is very, is, is an ad, is, is my excuse for how inadequate they uh, will probably be as I was shoddily putting them together over lunch. All right, so the questions, uh, the three points I just want to raise. The question of uh, what labels or names we assign to various engagements and activities involving violence, force, or war. This has come up in a few different ways. We saw it at the outset from uh, Michael Walzer's talk where he distinguished just war from a holy war, which he then further juxtaposes uh, with notions uh, from Jewish concepts of commanded wars or permitted. We see this as well in uh, Chris Brown's disqu disquisition on the war on terror and its evolving or its evolution into this conflict formerly known as the War on Terror. I mean, to some extent, we need these labels and concepts, uh, and we need the deeper meanings that they convey to kind of think through these different political concerns, the kinds that preoccupied Gene. We need to know who the users are. I mean, you can find the language of just war uh, explicitly found far more often than you will find holy war, right, in terms of who the users are. So that's a uh, that's an important difference to keep in mind. So we have to be prepared to explain these concepts, to contest them, or even to expand them. So whether that's finding wisdom in the past, as James Turner Johnson suggests, or adding new categories that don't exist in the past, i.e. prohibited wars, as Professor Walzer proposes. Um, so we need we need to we may need to do think, think differently than uh, in light of different circumstances, given that for example, in the case of the war on terror, uh, that there's a lot of different forms of coercion or at least instruments of power to bring to bear, many of which not involving force. Um, for example, the discussions of surveillance. I, I was actually thinking about um, that, that for all those who criticizes uh, George Bush's moniker about the war on terror, the sort of renunciation of that, one, one wonders if his early designation of the crusade against terror might have been, in some ways, a more accurate description uh, in that it also it could have incorporated many alternative non-lethal measures. There's a long history of American presidential crusades, crusades against poverty, crusades for education. There was at one point, I think, during the Clinton years, a crusade for internet access. So, I mean, you know, one, there, there's some precedent for this, but of course, in, the, in George Bush's case, the crusade, little c crusade, was immediately confused with capital C, Crusades, and of course, then it was mistranslated in many parts of the world as a war 
of the cross. So it just goes to show that the words, the, ta- the terms, the concepts we all use really matter. We need to employ, scrutinize them carefully. That's what Jean taught us anyway. If you want to see an interesting discussion of this in one of her last uh, essays before she died, it's a, uh, an essay on the varieties of violence with violence in quotes. Okay, point number two. Um, I think all the papers uh, point to a common theme, um, or in, at least allude to it, the difficulty with Jean. Right? Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm shorthanding this one as, okay? This is Christine's account of the difficult feminist. This is the difficulty of pegging her on a political spectrum. This was a conversation at lunch. Did she move from the left to the right, or did the times move and she stayed the same? Um, is this pegging process really important? The problem of pegging her intellectually, if you're invoking Camus, Bonhoeffer, Arendt, and uh, Augustine, you know, where does that place you? Well, that's, pretty, that's a pretty big uh, um, pool to swim in, right? So, uh, and then Deborah's, um, I think, apt description of Jean is a difficult just war thinker, and let me just say a few words on that, given her uh, just war politics approach uh, that was really much more expansive for the use of, uh, in, its, in its call for the use of force rather than restrictive. So this comes out in several papers, though I, I think it's also important to note that she favored more restrictive and discriminatory, discriminatory uses of force, this is the whole in Bella discussion, uh, when many have overlooked this in recent years or just kind of taken it for granted. I want to point you to a, 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 an exceptional essay entitled The Triumph of Just War Theory and the Dangers of Its Success, authored by uh, Michael Walzer. Uh, I think the title says it all, but you should read it anyway, of course. And I was thinking about this uh, during uh, Chris's discussion of drone, war, drone warfare and, uh, and Eric's commentary. I mean, it sort of brought to mind what are, it seems to me are dual meanings of asymmetric warfare. And let me, let me try to explain. On the one hand, we criticize terrorists who target civilians and eagerly kill discriminately, often by resort to crude weapons, primitive, or innovative uses of things that are not designed to be weapons, i.e. civilian airliners. And, and, that, and thus partly in our efforts to distinguish ourselves, and I'm, I'm shorthanding our here for American government, and I understand all the problems with the our language, the royal we, sorry, I wrote this at lunch, okay. So, but the U.S. has developed in some cases accidentally, but it now uses intentionally, including with right intention, um, very discriminating weapons that can target combatants narrowly to the point of targeting people by name. Now, but of course, um, uh, this means we can now undertake riskless warfare from warships 500 miles off the coast or even from remote sites in the middle of the desert, not Saudi Arabia or Iraq, but Nevada or Phoenix. Chris described this mode of warfare, and in many places, Gene condemned it, or at least worried about its implication. But the upshot is this, that the efforts to be morally discriminating now become a new form of critique about our own form of asymmetric warfare being now unfair. And I think this is one illustration of the simultaneous triumph and danger of just war thought, and more importantly, just war practice. This is a problem for all of us to ponder carefully, whether we are just war thinkers or critics. Were she here, I would put this matter to Jean directly, but if we are going to criticize certain developments that seek to conform, we need to at least be prepared to think about what the the alternative is, what is it we're really after. Finally, third point here, I think we need to ponder seriously what it means that uh, two great just war thinkers, Jean Elstein and Jim uh, Johnson, have now really turned serious attention and scholarship to the question of sovereignty, the state, legitimate authority. One of Jean's oft-heard refrains after September 11th was, now we remember what governments are for. And she devotes an entire chapter in, um, to the concept of legitimate authority in her Just War Against Terror book, even though while in the next chapter she kind of breezes through the other criteria. Okay? But the matter of what makes an authority legitimate is still very much contested, even up for grabs, as we heard in Cecilia Lynch's com- uh, paper today. Does a government's failure to embody absolute justice disqualify it from exercising or enacting relative justice in the world? For example, to stop a humanitarian disaster. What's the bar for reaching legitimate authority, for qualifying for the negative uh, privileges associated with modern notions of sovereignty, self-determination, the right to non-intervention? 
should we or must we then repair to medieval notions of positive sovereignty and responsibility, as Jim Johnson, Gene Elstein, and others, have, Daniel Philpott, have alluded to. Or perhaps, as Professor Walser suggests, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, there's basic civic peace that we must understand as the baseline of legitimacy. It would follow, then, that in countries where that does not pertain, a better peace must be not only intended but feasible uh, in any uh, goal and a goal of any effort to involving outside military intervention. But in, these two, in this case, the locus of the decision is the country facing intervention, whereas in Cecilia Lynch's argument, the test of an authority's le legitimacy is the intervening body. Now, based on Elstein, Johnson, and others' work, this, different tra this difference traces back to very different assumptions about sovereignty and whether the negative right to non-intervention famously set out in Hobbesian or uh, Westphalian schemes, which Philpott discusses, or whether early positive responsibilities must be summoned up again, applied to both to nations who may have, used, have force used against them, as well as those nations who may use force. Put simply, this is the question, must we first agree upon sovereignty, including all of the theological, ethical, and political questions it raises, before we can reach greater consensus about the use of force? At the very least, it seems, understanding these differences gives us deeper meaning of why we disagree upon these matters. Now, these are just a few questions that came to me over the last uh, few days. I don't mean to privilege these. There may be others. The discussions of Gene's uh, relation to Niebuhr is certainly one. Questions about just war and punishment are things that uh, I've uh, heard uh, referenced a few different times now. But perhaps at least this can provide a springboard for some further conversation in our last discussion. This is the last formal opportunity to, to discuss Jean's work in this conference, but I am very heartened to know that the many issues she has put on the table and called upon others here to take up will be discussed by us and by numerous others for many, many years to come. Thank you. So we really open it now first for just the panelists for um, open conversation. I know that there still have been some bees um, running around from the conversation. I welcome those now. And then with whatever time we have left, we'll turn to the audience for questions. So um, we'll start with Professor Walter. And please uh, just hand the mics amongst yourself, three by three. Yeah. Um, I, 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 just, I want uh, to, to challenge or at least qualify the idea that many people seem to have accepted these last couple of days that uh, Jean moved to the right uh, in her last uh, years or in the last decade. Um, I don't know how much that matters. Uh, none of us have been appointed to uh, assign political labels, but it matters to me and I, I, want, to, um, I want to raise some questions uh, about that move. I can't do it with regard to uh, the, the internal feminist arguments, though I do, would want to insist that those were internal feminist arguments, despite efforts of some feminists to expel Jean. Um, but I want to talk about Iraq, because uh, Jean and I disagreed about that, but that wasn't a left-right disagreement. It was a disagreement within the left. I tried to suggest that in my opening talk when I described two wars, uh, the Red Army marching on Warsaw to uh, bring communism to Poland, the American Army marching on Baghdad to bring democracy to uh, Iraq. The first of those wars was Trotsky's War. I have to start this argument a little uh, far away from where Gene was, but the first of those arguments was Trotsky's War, and the second of those the second, of, the second of those wars was uh, the, a neocon war, and the neocons were the descendants of, not the only descendants of, but one line of the Trotskyites. Um, the, all of the elder neocons grew up in the Trotskyite sects uh, in New York in the 1940s. Um, and their politics was a left internationalist politics. It's a good thing to use force when necessary to Im make the world a better place, uh, to improve the lives of people in faraway countries, uh, even though um, we don't know much about them. 
Uh, so that was a, a left a left impulse. Um, now, uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld were simply imperial civil servants. So their, <laughs> their war wasn't the war that Jean defended. It was the neocon war that she defended, and that was that was a left war. Uh, now I know there were no Trotskyist cells in Carl in Colorado uh, among the Lutherans of Colorado in the 1940s, but there is a religious version of this left impulse to act in the world to make it better, and um, and that was Jean's impulse, um, and I I I I think she I think she was wrong, but but. Leftists get things wrong sometimes. Um, and that doesn't make them right wingers. Uh, we, we have our own ways of getting things wrong. Uh, and it's important to, um, well, I just, I, it's important to me to say that for me, uh, Jean was always a, a woman of the left. Can I just uh, uh, make a, a kind of a, a total agreement with that, but uh, add, a, add a point to it? When I first met uh, Jean, it was in 1982, and I met her because I was a very good friend of Bill Connolly, William Connolly, uh, and so was she uh, uh, at that time. Uh, and I'm still a good friend of, uh, I hope I'm a good friend. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think of myself as a friend of Bill's, and I certainly think of myself as a friend of, uh, of Jean's. Uh, but they lost contact completely and no longer had any contact. And I, I think in a way that tells a story about what has ha happened to the left, different varieties of the left over the last 30 years. And one way of telling that story, and I, I mean, it's a way that I like, although uh, other people wouldn't accept the terminology, is to say that the left really divided, that there was, uh, 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 it divided with the end of the Cold War, because the end of the Cold War brought certain things to the surface that hadn't been there before. And in the early 80s, uh, a kind of essentially anti-imperialist uh, uh, motivation combined with a kind of anti-authoritarian, anti-fascist motivation, uh, and you could see these as part of the same basic uh, desire for non-domination, if you like. Uh, and those two, but those two motivations, I think, did divide out uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, and part of the reaction was how people reacted to uh, challenges to uh, enlightenment values which were coming not from imperialists but from uh, anti-imperialists, people who called themselves anti-imperialists. The, there's a sense in which, for me and for many people in Britain, the Zalman Rushdie affair 20 odd years ago was a, a crucial point where uh, or one, uh, the people divided into those people who uh, regarded the, uh, uh, the death threat against his life as being absolutely fundamental uh, and something that simply had to be resisted, and those people who, were, on the other hand, were prepared to make excuses for it in one way or another. Uh, and I think that, to me, was the beginning of a process in which the left, uh, 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 while still remaining left, divided into those people who were most worried about American power in the world and those people who were most worried about a kind of anti-enlightenment uh, movement that was uh, very powerful, particularly within radical Islam. And, and I, I think both parts of that movement remained part of the left, but they interpreted it. Uh, uh, what it meant to be in the left in dramatically different kinds of ways. So I would agree that I, to me, Jean remained on the left, but she was on a, a different kind of left from Bill Connolly now, uh, William Connolly, who is also, I think, still on the left, but uh, very differently. Yeah, okay, I'm going to change the register slightly. Um, I think that with Jean's death, a lot of her work, of course, is going to take up the attention of a lot of PhD students coming along who uh, are, the, are the future, not us. 
Uh, and they are going to be actually taking on a lot of these questions. Was Jean left? Was Jean right? And I think a lot of them are also going to be refusing that dichotomy. Um, and I think part of the importance of Jean Elstein is the difficult person, the difficult feminist, because a difficult feminist can't please anyone. You can't please the feminists, and you can't please the non-feminists, and you can't please the left, and you can't please the right, because the particular path that you are, you know, that you are forging is really not describable in those terms. So I would like to actually reject those terms too on Jean's behalf, although I have no right to speak for her. Um, but I do think that a lot of debates, I mean, a lot of the debates I was listening to this afternoon are internal debates too. I think what's uh, that, that are then become, uh, some enter into sort of the public consciousness or, or certain individuals become public intellectuals and then they become externalized. Um, and I think that that is uh, what happened also with Jean and her relationship with feminists. What started out as a little kind of quibble and a, and a little war within feminism then became something that I do think Jean had <coughs> Jean externalized uh, to some degree as well. I mean to say she brought it out in a number of books many, many years later. It was something that haunted her, shall we say, or perhaps continued to anger her. So in a sense, this became uh, seen by a lot of people, her, her, her anger at the so-called radical feminists who, who increasingly were stretched to include so many kinds of feminism that I never could figure out who was outside if there was a possibility outside the radical. Um, and um, I just think that a lot of this is going to be reassessed uh, now, and including uh, the fact that she did herself continue, often a one-sided, I would have to say, war with, with certain parts of feminism, because a feminist did, in many ways, write her off, in ways that I'm really very, very aware of from the inside and the outside and from several, from having a foot in several fields, including international relations. I am fully expecting, however, that several of my PhD students are going to be among those that are reevaluating her work, at least in feminist IR. When she died, um, one of the strongest conversations I had, interestingly and, and somewhat unexpectedly, was with my PH, former PhD student who's an Indian, uh, uh, Swati Parashar, whose work I I recommend to you on uh, militant women in South Asia. She started reading all of Jean's books, uh, possibly in a sense for the first time, uh, in depth. And she kept writing to me. She's very intellectual. She kept writing to me almost every day, saying, "This was really great stuff. This, listen to what she said on page such and such." Um, and I think that's kind of the beginning of a recognition that. And often happens when people die, unfortunately, not when they're with us, uh, a recognition that all of this is more worth talking about than some of the actual politics that emerged around it suggested. I, uh, one of the courses I teach regularly is a 300 level course on war in the Western traditions, and one of the things that I have done since 9-11 is to assign uh, a couple of books, let the students make a choice, and one of them is al has always been uh, Just War Against Terror. And uh, uh, the students are asked to, uh, to read this book and write a paper on it. And the best papers have been the ones that have focused on her conception or her treatment of the idea of authority and what this means for, for politics uh, within the, the frame of thinking about the uh, responsibility to respond to uh, a terroristic attack. Uh, I, I, I confess I'm a little, I'm more than a little uncomfortable with this whole matter of, of whether she was right or whether she was left. I think she was Christian. Uh, she came to, uh, came of age morally uh, in a time when the idea of love, love of neighbor, was really the central conception guiding the idea of Christian ethics. You see this in Niebuhr, and the influence of, of Niebuhr is probably where this comes into her own thinking. Uh, and it, uh, it implies that you do have a responsibility for your neighbor, for other people. And, and, and this uh, may sometimes, uh, where, where states are concerned at least, this may sometimes imply the use of armed force. 
for either for defense of your own people or for defense of somebody else's people who are being oppressed by perhaps their own rulers. And, and so it, it seems to me that, that, that uh, uh, this idea, which also is, is uh, traceable back to Augustine, uh, is, uh, is, is an important uh, focus for where she came out on the whole matter of the use of armed force, the just, just war idea. And it, uh, it gave her her own distinct perspective on this. Uh, from, from a non-religious perspective, it may look like a left-right issue. And it may, sound, may seem leftist or it may seem rightist, depending on where you place yourself along that spectrum. But it seems to me that, uh, that, that we also need to think about the other side of her uh, political thinking, which was the influence of Christianity upon it and uh, the, the moral judgment she made in her, in her own writing. One of the things that I liked very much about, about Jean's writing uh, on war was that she understood that war is not simply uh, World War II or World War III, perhaps. Uh, that is, it's, this, this is a, a common misperception that one finds in a lot of recent just war uh, writing in this country particularly, that, uh, that war has to do with big, massive armies fighting big, massive armies uh, at the behest of big, massive states that are somehow so, so uh, uh, big that they, they don't have any uh, uh, moral uh, presence anymore. And, and that wasn't, that, that's, that's just not the case uh, in the, the general sense. Uh, and, it, uh, and if that's how we think about warfare, we are blind to what the actuality of warfare uh, since World War II has largely been. Uh, and we are blind to those, uh, those issues having to do with uh, evils that are created that only perhaps the use of force can deal with. Uh, and so we're led into making wrong judgments about them, it seems. So much of recent just war argumentation has actually been used to argue against the possibility of war, uh, precisely because the assumption is that if you get a war, then this means everything comes out and everybody gets targeted and the whole world is the worse for it. And uh, the, the value of a perspective like Jean's, it seems to me, is, uh, is that it reminds us that maybe there are other ways of thinking about the responsibilities of government vis-a-vis -vis the use of force that do not uh, fall into that kind of a trap. Uh, I miss her greatly. <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, everyone. I, I think that um, yeah, on this um, issue of her being a, a boundary breaker, one sees that in so many dimensions of her thought that she didn't uh, follow the, you know, orthodoxies of how you had to do do things and think about things and she had the uh, unusual person to have the kind of courage but also the wherewithal and the kind of confidence in her vision to kind of think in ways that didn't fall that uh, fall into kind of the usual categories I mean on this issue of left and right look look where she published she was on the editorial board of first things but she also published in the nation and uh, one can look back across her career and see you know, the many places where she kind of left the deposits of her thoughts and, um, you know, very obviously not uh, easily um, confinable uh, in the categories. Um, I think the way she thought about in the field of, she was trained in political science. Um, you know, the dominant trend over the past generation or so has been towards the kind of uh, overwhelming positivism. So many of the leading departments in political science, it's, um, teaches you how to think about politics in terms of hypothesis testing and kind of um, uh, this very, very positivistic analysis. And I think you know, in international relations, the kind of debates we had in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s involving you know, Stanley Hoffman and Robert Tucker and kind of we still have with, with you know, involving Michael Walzer and Jim Johnson and, and so forth. But that's just so um, kind of marginalized in the way that we're taught to be international relations scholars. Uh, but Jean, again, was somebody who, you know, wanted to carry on that tradition of 
Uh, there was no f easy kind of divide between moral analysis and empirical analysis. And she represents a kind of older tradition of thought that where those things went together and necessarily informed um, one another. And I think also in the sense that she was a, a religious thinker and a Christian thinker, the um, New York Times uh, obituary, uh, which was uh, very extensive and very honoring to her, um, spoke of her as a Christian intellectual and it spoke of her as if this is something that was ki is kind of unusual. And we were talking about this over lunch. That I think there was a time where Christian intellectuals and public intellectuals were very much a part of the conversation. Think about 1950s and 60s when people like John Courtney Murray or Jacques Maritain or Abraham Joshua Heschel or um, uh, Ryan Reinhold Niebuhr obviously was kind of a model of a Christian public intellectual who um, engaged in, in Time Magazine would put people like that on their cover. Well, um, today it seems as though you know, America is still a place where religious thought is very important, but it's a little bit like it's all over here on one side, often not necessarily reflective in the way that those characters were. And then um, secular perspectives are, I think, much more dominant today than, than or, or prominent today than they were then. But Jean is somebody who I think, again, carries on that older tradition of a very reflective thought um, uh, not, that's not very easily uh, containable and you know, for all these reasons she will indeed be uh, very missed. I'll keep my comments brief. I've had a chance to say a few things but just uh, echoing some of these, uh, uh, some of the other uh, um, speakers. Um, it, it's interesting. I think Jean, Jean tells us and shows us the importance of interpretation. Why you have to really take that uh, enterprise seriously because you can look at her positions on abortion or same-sex marriage or even the Affordable Care Act and if you take those three alone you would peg her in a certain way uh, but that is not the totality of, uh, of Jean Elstein uh, and if you want to know uh, some of her um, her liberal even hippie bona fides I, I had a chance to, um, um, to to share and experience some of those at her funeral it was wonderful um, there was an experience when after the funeral mass and the and communion had been given the, um, the priest said, invited the congregation, if you would now pass the, pass the peace. And um, as I looked out into the pews, I saw people passing the peace like this. Um, so I, <laughs> this was not to be in doubt. Uh, and, and it's really, really important to note, um, for, you know, she hopped all around the spectrum. She called herself at different points a, a, an extreme centrist or a radical moderate or I think even a radical Democrat. A little D Democrat was one of her her favorites, um, but she, this was not a woman who, who issued or needed to issue retractions. I mean, there's a remarkable consistency and there's a remarkable resilience of the positions that she has taken over time. You don't, um, and that's, some people fault her for that, but, but I, think it's a, I think it's a great credit to us. So let's open this up for questions. Oh, no, we're not. Oh, we're not. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I don't think, it, it, it has been recognized yet how difficult the task has been for these scholars here to be some of the first people commenting critically following Professor Elstein's death, um, not just in a blog post, but truly really an academic paper. So um, we're going to move into our reception now, but before we do that, please join me in thanking our panelists here. And let, well, sorry, Errol, did you have? Yeah, please, please. Come up, come up. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Michael had, had um, generously offered uh, at the beginning of the conference that if there were at any point I wanted to say anything, uh, that I could, um, I, this is way over my head, so uh, there was nothing to, uh, for me to really say, but uh, I do want to say thank you uh, to everyone. Um, Michael for putting this one together, uh, Deborah for putting uh, together uh, the, the one or two of the previous ones. Um, I had some part uh, in this um, because Jean would uh, ask, she would give me a list from her CV and she'd say, 
find these articles because Deborah needs them, uh, Michael needs them uh, to send to the conferees uh, so they can prepare their papers. Uh, so this meant searching through periodicals, uh, copying them, faxing them, uh, finally <laughs> figuring out that I could use the internet for some of these things <laughs> and send them electronically. Uh, so uh, I, uh, that was my uh, small contribution um, to, uh, to the conferences. Um, many times um, uh, I would uh, answer the phone uh, for Jean. Jean really didn't like to answer the phone very much. Uh, so I would answer the phone and I would get uh, messages. Uh, I first met Al McDonald, not in person, but uh, his office would be calling and saying, you know, it's Al McDonald's office calling, uh, uh, can he speak with, uh, with uh, Professor Elstein? <clears throat> so my uh, connection to many people were uh, disembodied voices on the telephone. Uh, or electronic messages. So there were lots of names that I knew, and that's really been a delight for me uh, to um, be here today and yesterday because I met some folks whose names I knew um, from correspondence, um, uh, but whose faces I had never seen. Uh, so that has been uh, that has been quite a delight, um, and and. In light of the comments that um, you folks have made, uh, starting uh, um, with Michael Walzers, I'm really delighted that you said that because um, I personally had a real problem with uh, people who were busy pigeonholing uh, what Gene was, and uh, I. No, I knew Jean for half a century. Uh, not in her earliest life, certainly, but she would <clears throat> more than once uh, say to me, and this is not to say that her thinking didn't evolve. I mean, let me be clear about that, because it certainly did. I mean, you, you can tell that through her, through her work. But she would, she would often say to me about some topic or another, did I always talk about this this way? And I would have to say yes. You know, um, she, uh, <clears throat> I was reminded when uh, someone said uh, that, you know, she broke barriers. Um, she broke barriers very early on as well. Um, you know, she, she married young, she had children young. Um, when she was interviewing for the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, the question she was asked was, well, how are you going to go to graduate school? You have three young children. What are you going to do? Well, we all see what she did. So thank you all very much. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.